Well, we're continuing in, in the book of Romans, and um, I'm really trying to be faithful to what the Lord is, is speaking. You know, as, as, I, as I pray and I ask the Lord to, to reveal what is it that, that I should be saying, what, what are the things that I should be teaching. And so, in that light, uh, let's continue. Again, I'm not sure that I'm going to get very far. Now, I will tell you, for those of you here, who are here in the class or those of you who are online, you can also access it. In our church, we're going through the book of Romans, and they started in January, and so they're covering about, about two chapters per month. So they're going at a much faster clip than us. So if the, if the pace that I'm going at is not sufficient, just uh, uh, log on to that, and you'll, you'll be able to, to move on ahead. But I, I just, the, the way I prepare is I never go in there saying, I've got to cover seven verses, or I've got to cover half a chapter. I just spend time with the Lord and I read over and over again the passage. And then, I, and then my eyes get caught on a certain section and then, and then all these, these texts and these Bible verses will start coming to me that will complement that. And I want to be faithful to teach according to that. So let's start reading Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, um, as I was looking at this, we mentioned a little bit of this last time, but let me just say in verse 1, it says, set apart for the gospel of God. It describes this the gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? What is the gospel? I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where it summarizes for us what the gospel is. It says here in, in, in Romans 1, it says it is the gospel of God. So this message is of God. It says in, in 1, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm sorry, did I say something else? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures." So, so look, look what Paul says in, 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 in chapter one of first, uh, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. He says, I'm making known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preached to you. This is the message that I came to, the, to the, the church of Corinth with. This is the message. And he says, and you receive this message, and you stand by this message. It's not that the gospel was for us and no longer for us. It, it continues to be for us. He says, by which also you are saved. You are saved by this message. It is the gospel message by which you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He's going to tell us later in this chapter how it's possible to believe in vain. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. The most important thing is this. This is the most important message of everything that Paul is telling us in the New Testament. This is the most important thing. I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Exactly what Paul received, he gave to us. When I share the gospel with people, I always tell them, I am sharing with you exactly the message as I received it. Paul says, I'm sharing to, with you as of first importance what I also received. Here it is. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So now inherent in that is that we are sinners. Inherent in that that He died for our sins is that we are sinners. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So it embodies His death, His burial, and His resurrection. That's a one-sentence summation of the Gospel message. If you are trying to share the Word of God was with an unbeliever and get them saved. If you have a message other than this, it's not the gospel that Paul preached. It's not the gospel as it was presented to us. I'll give you an example. Uh, 
Recently, somebody said, you, you know, we, we've, got a, we've got a new way of presenting the gospel to, to uh, uh, the Chinese. I said, oh, really? What's this new way? And he sent me the way, and he, he sent me a, a, a link to a video of a guy sharing the gospel to the Chinese. And I thought it was terrible. He says, because the Chinese revolve around uh, shame. Everything is shame for them. And, and uh, so they started, he started with Adam and Eve, and he started in the, go- in, 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 in the garden, and they were naked and not ashamed. And I'm like, why on earth would you start with Adam and Eve when the gospel message clearly does not start with Adam and Eve? Try to get, try to get an educated person who's never heard of anything and start, start talking about the first man and the first woman walking around in a garden naked. It seems like a very awkward way t- to start. And it gets more awkward from there. Why anybody would try to use a different message in preaching the gospel, I don't know. It is like picking up Shakespeare and saying, I'm going to tweak this Shakespearean sonnet because I probably know how to present it a little bit better than Shakespeare. That's what it would be like. He says, this is the message. This is the gospel according to God. That's what he tells us, that this is the gospel in... in, 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 uh, um, in Romans chapter 1, he says, set apart for the gospel of God. God has a package. I'm amazed at the simple gospel. You can share the gospel with a four-year-old. And then you can, you can share it with a, with a PhD in chemistry. And that same message impacts both of them. The gospel message, the simple message that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and he rose from the dead, This is the simple message of the gospel. And this is what really amazes me, the power behind this message. You don't have to bring in all sorts of philosophers. You don't have to bring in all sorts of your own little ideas. This message is the gospel from God. Then he says in verse 2 of Romans chapter 1, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This was promised concerning his son, Everything in the Old Testament is pointing toward Jesus concerning His Son. It says, It was promised beforehand through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning His Son. And I want to I look at, at uh, uh, what Jesus had to say about this. Look at what Jesus had to say about this. Turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And we're going to start reading in John chapter 5. And just so that you have the context of John chapter 5. Uh, really interesting context here in John chapter 5. Jesus heals a man who was, who was, uh, um, uh, who had, for, for 38 years, he, he was unable to walk. So Jesus comes and he heals the man. And in John chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and he picked up his pallet and he began to walk. Now we're, now, now we're, read, we're continuing to read in John chapter 5, verse 8. Now it was on the Sabbath day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath day and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But then he goes on to say, look, the guy who healed me told me to pick up my pallet and walk. I mean, what do you want me to do? I'm healed. And it says in verse 16 of John chapter 5, for this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. You know, can you imagine that this is what they're persecuting him for? He has healed a lame man on the Sabbath day, and now they're persecuting him for this. I mean, grow up, guys. I mean, can't you find something better to persecute a guy for? In verse 17, he says to them, John chapter 5, but he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, some people will come and they will say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, really? What does this say? He made himself equal with God. You say, well, that's not exactly what he said. That's exactly what he said in the context of that Eastern culture in Israel at the time. When Jesus said, my father is working until now and I myself am working, how did they perceive it? Not from our Western culture, but from their Eastern culture 
2,000 years ago. How did they perceive it? They perceived it this way. For this reason, the Jews therefore were seeking to kill him seeking all the more to kill him. They wanted to kill him for breaking the Sabbath, but now they were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Jesus knew exactly how to say this in a way that that culture would understand it. We don't perceive it from our cultural view. We don't perceive it. And this happens. I mean... I have a lot of good friends that are Chinese. I love Chinese people. But they will translate for me a Chinese joke. And I don't find it funny at all. I just don't find it funny. And they're busting up. And I find absolutely nothing funny in that. Humor, as you know, is is cultural. Some things that you find funny in one culture aren't at all funny in another. And I'll smile in it just to be polite. But I still find nothing funny in it. Cultures are different. That culture knew exactly what he was saying. And then he goes on, and then he talks to them, and he's providing evidence. He says he has the witness of John, the witness of his works, the witness of the Father. And then he gets to the witness of Scripture. Because Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 2, he says, this is all about the Scriptures. It was all written there. And it was pointing toward his Son. So let's see what Jesus has to say about this in John chapter 5, verse 39. So he is substantiating who he is, that he is equal with God. He is substantiating this through the Scriptures themselves. And he says in verse 39 of John chapter 5, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So he's saying to these Jews, you search the scriptures because in them you have eternal, in them, uh, because you think that in them you have eternal life. He says, you search the scriptures. He doesn't just say, you know, you read through the scriptures, a passive sort of thing that many people do. He says, no, you Jews, you religious Jews, search the scriptures. You're just, just constantly looking back and forth. You look at, at in, 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 uh, in those Jewish gatherings, the gatherings among Orthodox Jews, and you go to the yeshiva, and you, you see the, the, the pit bull, where they're, they're having these discussions back and forth. It is intense. And they will take one little word in the Scripture, and, and to us it looks like they're arguing. In a sense, they are arguing, but this is normal. They're going back and forth, wrestling over every word in every passage, trying to make sense of it. Let me tell you something. When you read the Scriptures, don't ever think that you have a new revelation, that something's ne- something, this is something that nobody's ever thought of before. If it's the Old Testament, the Jews for thousands and thousands of years have been thinking about these things and wrestling with them. In the New Testament, for over 2,000 years, there have been scholars and, and Catholics and they've, they've wrestled over these things. You know, there's, there's a lot of work, a lot of labor that has gone on before us. But Jesus said, you search the Scriptures and you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about Me. Jesus said, the Scriptures that you read, your Tanakh, your Old Testament, it's testifying about Me. And you're will, unwilling to come to Me to have life. You think that in that Word you have life? You don't realize. It's Me in that Word that gives life. It's not that word in and of itself. It's me in that word. That's what he's saying to them. And then he goes on. Let's turn, look at verse 45 of John chapter 5. Look what Jesus said in verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus said, this Moses on whom you've set your hope, that he's paved this way for all Jews to be saved, he's the one who's going to stand there and accuse you. That's what he says. I mean, this this is like in your face. You think Jesus was always, oh, you know, I, I don't want to upset you. Don't let me say anything that would, me offend you? Oh, I, I am sorry. No, I don't want to do, 
Jesus was like, just put this right in their face. Moses, on whom you set your hope, he's going to accuse you. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. You know, once I was, I was uh, uh, counseling a young man who uh, was really doing tremendous stuff in ministry. Tremendous stuff. He had gone to Oxford to get his Ph.D. in theology. And uh, uh, he had come back, and then I was talking with him, and he was wrestling with certain things. There was no real power in his life. He knew a lot of things, but, but he was wrestling with it. And then I said, tell me, tell me what you've been reading lately. Tell me about the, in the scriptures. What have you been reading lately? So he started to tell me. I said, so, so how has that been speaking to you? How has the Lord been speaking to you through that? He says, well, you know, it's kind of hard because I'm always analyzing in the scriptures uh, uh, which, which passages are, are, are uh, um, really, really written of God and which things have been inserted. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <clears throat> You don't take every word of Scripture as absolutely true anymore. No wonder why you have no power. No wonder why you have no life. If you do not realize that every word in the Scriptures are true, that every word that we have is true, you have lost all moral high ground in sharing the Gospel, and you will have a defeated life. Mr. and Mrs. Scholar, if you have become so high and scholarly that you can critique and decide which part of Scripture you like and which part of Scripture has been inserted, you have lost all moral high ground because you are preaching from a book that you yourself do not believe. Jesus said, and, and he, the, 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 the higher criticism that goes on in the seminaries is this, that Moses did not even write the first five books of the Old Testament. They'll tell you this right out that Moses didn't write those books. And I said to him, look right here. You want to throw out the, the gospel according to John? Jesus said, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. Moses wrote that. Moses wrote about Jesus. And I shared this with this young man who, who was doing his PhD at, at Oxford. And he was like, I've never seen this before. And I said, right now, right now, we are going to get on our knees, right now, on our kitchen floor, and you are going to repent for not believing this Word of God. And he did it that very day, that night. And I still have these texts because he rose into a very famous young man, very famous preacher of the Gospel. And I have this text from him. He said, it is amazing. It's from that same night after he repented. He said, God is speaking to me from the Bible like when I first got saved. As soon as he repented of not believing every word in the Bible, boom, the word of God came open to him again. And it just showered in upon him. Jesus said, Moses wrote about me. There's no question about this anymore. Jesus said, Moses wrote about me. This is what Paul is saying. These scriptures were written by the prophets like Moses, and they all pointed toward the Son. And Jesus is saying right here, Moses wrote about me. If you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. Then he goes on, he says, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? If you do not believe the writings of Moses, how will you believe the words of Jesus? So I ask you, Mr. Theologian, Mrs. Theologian, Miss Theologian, if you do not believe the words that have been written by the prophets, how will you ever believe the things of Jesus? This word is so true. I take this word as absolutely true. Let's, let's look at another portion here. Let's look in... Uh, um, in, in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And we're going to start... We'll start reading from verse 17. Acts chapter 3, verse 17. And this is Peter speaking, and he says, And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. 
But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets, that His Christ would suffer, He has thus fulfilled. Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among his people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward all announced these days, It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. For you first, God raised up His servant and sent Him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Here Peter is underscoring the same thing. It is the Hebrew Scriptures that point to Jesus. The prophets were pointing to Jesus. He says in verse 17 of Acts chapter 3, And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. I'm not condemning you for not embracing the Word of God fully. You're acting in ignorance. We embrace the Word of God. We take it. He says, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that His Christ would suffer, He has thus fulfilled. He fulfilled exactly what was announced. So He says in verse 19, therefore repent and return. If you've not believed every word in the Scriptures, I urge you to do what that young man did with me that night on my kitchen floor. Repent. And and ask God to forgive you for not believing His Word. And then watch when you open up the Scriptures how it will come alive for you. Watch the renewed power that you will experience in your lives when you repent of not believing His Word. Jesus said, if you don't believe the writings of Moses, how will you believe me? He says, therefore, repent and return. You repent and you turn back to God. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. I'm giving you this day, this very day, a prescription for renewed power in your life so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You wonder why. You go into your quiet times and there's nothing. There's no power. You walk into your quiet time, you walk out of your quiet time with the same weakness and frustration that you walked into it. Because you don't believe. Because you don't believe. I urge you to repent and to spend time before the Lord. And this is what it says in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I go into my quiet time sometimes thinking, oh, I got a gazillion things to do. How am I going to complete all of this? Oh, it's just, it's just so overwhelming. And I go into my quiet time and I spend time with my Lord and He refreshes me from the Word of God. I read a text and poof, it just starts coming alive. And I search the Scripture. Oh, yeah, that reminds me of this text. And I read this. And, and I come out of that quiet time like a roaring lion. Nobody's going to stand in my way. I say, Shreen, stand back. I'm coming. She just rolls her eyes and shakes her head. You know, because she knows. And, but she's happy for me because I'm ready to take on the world. It, it, it's, just, it's just such power. He says it right here. In order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You get in the Lord's presence, boom, you're refreshed. You are refreshed in the Lord's presence. When you believe the Word of God. If you don't believe Moses, you're not going to believe me. If you don't believe the words of Scripture, you're not going to believe when Jesus speaks to your heart. You won't be able to receive it. The methodology here to solve this is you repent and you return to Him. He says it right here, repent and return. Why would I ask that young man to join me right here on the kitchen floor, on your knees? Why would I do that? Because that's what the Scriptures command us to do. 
And then boom, the Word of God was open up to him. And I have saved those text messages from this young man. I just saved them because I've seen this sort of thing happen. He says, says, it's amazing. God's speaking to me like when I first got saved. And here was this great theologian coming from Oxford. And he had, he had been convinced that the scriptures were, you know, put together by some committee of rabbis or something or another. You repent of that. Jesus substantiated this. These were written, these words were written by Moses. And then he says, that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. When you do this, when you repent, he's going to send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. Jesus comes and say, oh, okay. You ready to believe now? Let me minister to you. Oh, Lord, this is so wonderful. What a quiet time. What a time of refreshment with you. I can take on the world now. Yeah, I still got all the same things confronting me that I had an hour ago. But now I can take them on. Now I can get through this thing. He will send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from ancient time. Again, he's underscoring, this was all prophesied. All of this was prophesied. We're just, we're just following the pattern here. Moses said, so now he's quoting from, from Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses said, quote, The Lord God will ri- raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people, unquote. He's saying Moses was writing about this Jesus. Moses was speaking about Jesus. That's why when we we study the Old Testament, I keep turning back to Jesus, because it's about Him anyway. It's all about Jesus. We cannot praise Jesus enough. We cannot give Him thanks enough for everything that He has done. He says, you search the Scriptures because in them you think you have life. He says, but you won't come to me to really get life indeed. Don't you understand? It's me in them that gives the life. It's not inherent just in the Scriptures. It's me in the Scriptures, Jesus is saying. And he says, and likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. He says, they were announcing these days. If you are the sons of the prophets... It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. For you first. We're going to see that with Paul's pattern as well. It was to the Jew first and the Jew first always. It was to the Jew first in the gospel presentation. It was to the Jew first that judgment would come if they denied the gospel. It was to the Jew first, and we will see that pattern. But we'll take, we'll take that up, we'll take that up at, at, a, at another time. But you see here, when he talks about in the book of Romans, that this is exactly what was prophesied. This is exactly what he's talking about. This is what it is. It's all written about Jesus, all about Him. I mean, the whole thing is just saturated with Jesus. The whole thing. And you can look. You can look in the Old Testament. I want you to, to look in the Old Testament. Let's, let's read a passage. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. It's just dripping with Jesus. The, the, the Old Testament cries out, Jesus cries out God's deliverance through His Son. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. He doesn't speak like this about about just a mere man. This is His Son. He says, my servant will prosper. He's going to be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. That's the type of praise you give to God. Because God is going to come in the flesh. This is the prophecy. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many as were astonished at you, my people, 
so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. He says, just as many people were astonished at you, his appearance, this servant of mine, his appearance is going to be marred more than any man and His form more than the sons of men. Jesus was scourged more than any man had ever been scourged. His body was absolutely shredded. From top to bottom, His body was shredded. His appearance was marred more than any man, and His form more than the sons of men. Jesus was absolutely shredded in that scourging. His appearance was just ripped to shreds. So when you see a scourging and you see Jesus come out of this and He looks like the same person that went in, that's not a good depiction of it. He was so shredded. And that's why the proclamation when Jesus got done with that scourging and He came out of that, wearing that crown of thorns, He came out of that and He started walking back. He was presented back to Pilate who had who had condemned him to the scourging. It was said, Pilate said, Behold the man. Behold the man. That was the proclamation. Behold the man. This man, whose body was absolutely shredded, this is the image of a man. A total self-donation, one for the other. Jesus donating His life on our behalf. That is what manhood is. It is a total self-donation, one for the other. Behold the man. And what's going to be the outcome of this? Verse 15 of Isaiah 52. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. That means beyond, beyond just the Jews. In the Old Testament, when it speaks of the nations, that means the Gentiles. This is going to spread all over. This is not just for the Jews anymore. This is going to go all over. What my servant is going to go through, this is going to touch all the nations. This is too big, too great, just for this one little nation. This is going to touch them all. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what, not, what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. The testimony of Jesus shuts the mouths of the kings. And you see this very same thing with King Agrippa when Paul witnessed to him of this resurrection. King Agrippa looks at him and he says, you're going to make me become a Christian. They don't know what to say. I have seen this happen. I sat with Bob McNair, who's passed away now. He's the guy who started the Houston Texans. He had just bought the Houston Texans. And I sat with him in his home in River Oaks. And uh, uh, right there on, I think it's River Oaks Boulevard. I mean, just just big house. It was him, his banker, his butler, and me. And we, I sat in his home, and I looked at him, and, and uh, he had just spent $750 million dollars uh, uh, buying the football team to come to Houston. Now that seems inexpensive, but at the time, that, that was 22 years ago, all right? 21, 20 years ago, 21 years ago. And then he had spent $500 million building what's now NRG Stadium, which, again, would cost twice that now. So he had spent like $1.25 billion getting a football team. And so I was in his house, and I looked at him, and we were trying to, talking about some business deal, and I stopped, and I looked at him, and said, Bob, you know what the most important thing in life is? He said, what's that? I said, it's the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you what that can do in a man. And I just marched around his library, around the table in his library, just talking about God and the power of God, and what God can do in a man's life. And he just sat there, absolutely dumbfounded, and his banker was like, I mean, just... Didn't know what to say. And for 30 minutes, I just marched around preaching Jesus. And I said, do you believe this? He says, I think I do. I do. This shuts the mouths of kings. This is the message of the cross. 
This is the message. This is what was foretold. And then you can go into Isaiah 53 and see how this maps out the crucifixion of Jesus on behalf of his people. The Old Testament is dripping with Jesus. This is what he's talking about in Romans chapter 1, verse 2, which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son. Every word in this book is absolutely true. If you do not take hold of that, you will be devoid of power. You have lost all high ground in this. You may be able to talk a good game, but there's no power. God's Word is true, absolutely true. And I know you're very smart and you've taken all sorts of classes and you took even Religion 101. And so you know a lot. And you can, you, you, you know, you can outsmart all of these things. You're not outsmarting God. You want power in your life. This book is true. You listen to the testimony of Billy Graham. Billy Graham wrestled with these same issues. Being an educated person, wrestled with the same issues. And he talks about one day he fell on his knees and he said, Lord, I take every word in the Bible as true. Every word as true. He said that was the day that power filled him for preaching. That was the very day. This word is true. It was just as prophesied. And Jesus said, Moses spoke of me. You want power? It comes through me. It's not just inherent in the word. It's there because of me. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. The word was with God. And the word was God. John chapter 1 verse 1. And then in John chapter 1 verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Jesus was the Word in the beginning. Jesus Himself was the Word. It's in Him there is life. And the life was the light of men. And then that very same Word becomes flesh in chapter 14. In chapter, in verse 14 of John chapter 1. Becomes flesh. It's all embodied in Jesus. If you do not know the Lord, I urge you, just send me, send me an email to tour at rice.edu. You send me that email. I will tell you my story of how I came to faith. And I guarantee you, you will get saved that very same day. We won't leave that Zoom call till you are saved. You will get saved that very same day. You say, how could I know that? Because I know it. Because I know it. You send me the email making the request. If you don't know the Lord, send me that message and I will share with you. Send me that message. I will share with you. And, and, uh, um, and I'll tell you about the Lord and you'll get saved that very day. I see it all the time. You'll get saved that very day because this is God's message. This is God's gospel, not mine. I won't tell you anything about my own message. I'll tell you this message, which is ordained of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. What power. And the power is there because of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you are the life in the scriptures. You are the one who gives life in the scriptures. You are the one who brings life. Lord, I pray for the lost who may be on this call that they would come to you, that they would come and receive Jesus this very day. Say, Lord, forgive me because I am a sinner and come into my life. I believe Jesus has risen from the dead. I believe Jesus is Lord. And Father, I pray for those on this call, those in this room, that may think, that may have thought that that this scripture, some things are true, some things aren't. Father, I pray that this very day and even right now they would repent and they would say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for doubting your word so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord so that they may experience refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Father, I pray that this very day they would walk in repentance so that they could experience new life. And Father, I pray for believers 
that they would learn to extract the beautiful life that comes through Jesus, through the Word of God, that they can be refreshed every morning, refreshed even as the Scriptures testify, that times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord would come upon them, they would, that they would have strength for the day, strength for their families, that their faith would get raised up so that they could pray for their marriages, for their families, for their spouses, for their children. Lord, I pray that they would receive grace so that they would be able to pray and see the power of God in their, in their business, in their work, in their jobs, in their careers. Father, that they would learn that there is blessing and grace in your presence because you are the one who has life, Lord Jesus. Jesus stood and he cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Father, I pray that they would know the power that comes from Jesus and rivers of living water, rivers of living water can be taken from Jesus as he offers that to us. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink so that they would see in their thirst, in their hunger, in their need, they would come to Jesus and just drink. And if anyone believes in me, that they would believe in you, that they would believe in the name of the Son of God. If anyone believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water, that they would be able to get water from you, Lord, and that would flow out of them in every situation they confront. Lord, thank you. Lord Jesus, forever I shall thank you and praise your name. Forever I shall thank you for giving your body to be marred more than any man. For giving your blood to be sprinkled over all the nations. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work that you did. Blessed be your name. Amen.